They're struggling. It's very emotional. An unimaginable loss after a tragic crash in South Jordan. We know he's not in pain now. <laughs> How two young girls are remembering their friend, Brayden. He was shot last weekend in a Utah neighborhood plagued by crime. Shots began running out and uh, I was shot through the car. But is the fight to stop violence making a difference? It's an interview you will only see here. Tracking storms into eastern Utah today, but come tomorrow, it's all about the fire danger. Where we have red flag warnings and how long this hot and breezy setup will last. A black bear is roaming the streets of one Utah city. The efforts to track it down and what may have lured it to town. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts right now. A South Jordan family is going through the unthinkable tonight as they grieve the loss of their nine-year-old boy. Braden Long died after being struck by an SUV yesterday while riding an e-bike with another boy. Fox 13 News reporter Emily Tenzer spoke to some of the best friends today of Braden who says it just does not feel real. Emily. Kelly, Bob, I spoke to two sisters who say they've known Brayden since they were four or five years old. They say he's loving, energetic, and fearless. Posters, pictures, ribbons, and flowers. Two friends of Brayden Long returned to the site where he was hit by an SUV to build a memorial for their friend. We have known each other since we were like really little. Sisters Rayleigh and Bailey created the sign and drew some of their favorite moments. We did this fish right here because he had a fish tank in his room and he loved to just look at it and it just reminded me of him. It's just a hard time. The girls say Brayden was an adventurer, always down to explore. He did not like to be inside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was always outside. Even by himself, he's just on an adventure all the time. Sarah writing is Braden's neighbor and is speaking on behalf of his parents. It's one of the most difficult things that someone could go through. This is the second tragedy his family has experienced this year. Braden's 23 year old brother passed away just four months ago from a sudden brain injury. They're struggling. It's very emotional. <laughs> Emotional for everyone in the neighborhood as they try to imagine life moving forward without him. We know he's not in pain now. Because he was in pain and we knew it. I think in the coming days and weeks, it will be too quiet. South Jordan police say the other nine-year-old boy who was hit, he is in serious but stable condition. Now, a relative of Braden's created a GoFundMe to help his family with funeral expenses. You can find the link to that at fox13now.com. Reporting live in South Jordan, Emily Tenser, Fox 13 News, Utah. So sad, Emily. Thank you. The mayor of South Jordan is reacting to yesterday's tragedy. She says that she is heartbroken, of course, over what happened. I haven't had the opportunity to reach out to the family yet. I haven't talked to them out of respect for them, out of keeping uh, space for them to be able to process everything that's going on right now. And this is also a continuing investigation that's taking place. But want you to know how much we grieve with you, how sad we are. Our hearts are broken with you, and we are praying and sending thoughts and all the love of a community that we can for your loss. We mourn with you, and we're very sorry. They say the driver involved in this crash continues to cooperate with police. They also say their investigation shows no signs of impairment in this case. Tonight we are getting a closer look at an attack caught on camera outside the Pines Bar and Proper Brewing Company in Salt Lake. Want to warn you, this video is hard to watch. Surveillance video shows Cherokee Broderson shortly before midnight at 8th and Main on the 4th of July. A man approaches her, pulls a gun on her, and starts to drag her away. You saw it right there. She fights back until he runs off, leaving her alone. Police say they are still looking for the attacker. Local businesses we spoke with say the street is normally safe. This, this, I think this is an isolated incident. I don't think people should be afraid to be like walking on this street because this is uh, people commute through here all all the time. You know, we have the e-scooters and the bikes. Um, 
We have a lot of breweries around here and little restaurants, so it's like, it's just, it's very, uh, I think it's a safe area. It's just happened to be a night where everywhere's closed and lights are off. If you have any information about the attack, call Salt Lake Police. Now that attack comes after another shooting in the ballpark neighborhood last weekend. Well, tonight the ballpark neighborhood is on edge and working with police to address these recent violent crimes in a community council meeting. Fox 13 News reporter Spencer Joseph spoke exclusively with the man who was shot last weekend as police and community leaders look at what needs to change. It's a nice Thursday night in the ballpark neighborhood. A bees game is on and community members are out and about. But for some, lately, this neighborhood hasn't felt safe. Uh, shots began running out and uh, I was shot through the car. Bullet holes riddle the car that 20-year-old Mac Lovato was in on Sunday morning. I began to call 911, uh, let them know I was shot. About two minutes after that, you hear sirens. Whole road gets cut off. He's the victim of the shooting in the ballpark neighborhood where two bouncers at a music venue were arrested for the shooting. They kept saying that, you know, it's life threatening. Uh, we need to get him into the OR. This shooting, just one of the many that residents here are tired of seeing. So one of the things that strikes me about these incidents is how different they are. And one of the many shootings that residents dealt with Thursday as they gathered virtually to share their feelings. It's a great community. It's safe, it's vibrant, it's thriving. Um, my concern is, and what I'm hearing is they don't feel safe, and I want to talk with them. And listen to Chief Mike Brown share his plan to help. This gives me a chance to meet with this community, to talk about some of the things that we're doing, but more importantly, to hear their fears and concerns. Brown spoke with Fox 13 directly before tonight's meeting, outlining their new approach. We're into a new strategy called Hot block policing and in short it's taking officers and resources and putting them in the areas where crime is occurring. Police say this is going to make a difference. That'll deter uh, crime, it'll prevent crime and it'll help us serve that community better. Residents aren't sure. I think that I and other community members on this call feel that crime does affect our neighborhoods disproportionately. But bottom line, it's feedback that police say they need. They live, they work, they visit. That is their community. We need their help. As for Mac Lovato, his injuries are reality he will now face. I'm hurting pretty bad, but. And as for the ballpark neighborhood, they'll continue to fight crime. And I, I don't feel like our community should be scared to, to go out and have fun and, and then be like, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna get shot today or not. That was Fox 13 Spencer Joseph reporting there. The police chief also told him while those shootings make the headlines, it's the day-to-day -day crimes they also want to combat. Those hot blocks the chief mentioned will be at the Gail Miller Resource Center as well as 1400 Jefferson. Community members are hoping that will make a difference. Tonight, we have a touching tribute to show you from Kaysville. It's in memory of Macy Hill the little girl who was run over in a 4th of July parade. Kaysville police posted this photo on social media. Take a look here. They say officers stopped by a homemade bracelet stand on Tuesday. The girls who were running the stand said the money would be donated to Macy's family. The officers handed over all the cash they had and were proud to wear the bracelets today. I mean, it means the world to us. This has been, for me, it's been the hardest week um, in my career in law enforcement. So to see, you know, the community come together, um, it really affected the community as a whole. To, so to see everyone come together and support each other and just be so um, positive and uh, caring has been really amazing. Another amazing show of support. The GoFundMe page for Macy's family has now surpassed $113,000. Well, switching gears here, the uh, weather continues to warm up, and uh, there are red flag warnings out there now. Uh, yes. Allison. So this will be for western and northern Utah Friday to Saturday. Strongest wind gusts will be tomorrow noon to 9 p.m. Same thing for Saturday noon to 9 p.m. So red flag warnings have been issued today starting tomorrow. For today we had a few showers into northeast Utah mainly north of I-70. For tonight we're seeing a little bit less wind out there compared to earlier today.
in the last few days, what's going to ramp up tomorrow. So getting ready for bed, close to 80 to 85 for Salt Lake, Provo, and Ogden, 10 p.m. St. George still close to 90. Then tomorrow morning, 60s and 70s, mostly clear sky, additional clouds near the Idaho border. Then throughout the day, tomorrow clouds move into southwest Utah. So we're going to have a really hot day, a hot Friday here across the state, near 100 for many of you, Ogden, Salt Lake, Tooele, Provo, even mid-90s for the Cache Valley. We'll have additional clouds into southwest Utah. Wind will ramp up tomorrow around 15 to 25 miles per hour throughout the state. So we're going to have a gusty day. Those fire concerns will stick around through much of the weekend. So how long will this hot and windy pattern last? The answer is coming up. Two months since two little boys lost their lives. Tonight we hear testimony from the men who were with the driver at the time of the crash. I don't remember exactly what was said, but I do remember everybody else in the back screaming to stop. We're implementing something that's different than a lot of other systems in the West. Plus, as Utah's drought continues to worsen, one Utah farmer is trying something new to save all the water he can. And this bear in Summit County is still on the loose. What state wildlife officials want you to know tonight. Welcome back, everyone. We do have an update on a story we brought you late last month from Duchesne County. Deputies have now released these pictures of the people they say are persons of interest in a theft case from a local artist named Marcelo Galvin. Fox 13 News spoke with Galvin after this happened. He told us many of the things he had created to build his dream home were stolen, including a hand-built wrought iron spiral staircase, also a gate and a doorway. The spiral staircase was most special because it led to the room of his son who has autism. Here's a look at the photos of the persons of interest. Take a look here. This is also the truck they were driving. You see all of those works of art there in the trailer. If you know who they are, please call the Duchesne County Sheriff's Office. Tomorrow, the father of a Harriman girl who was badly injured in a DUI crash earlier this year will face a judge again. Nine-year-old Lily wound up in the hospital for nearly two months after the crash. This is video of when she came home from the hospital in April. On the night of the crash, Good Samaritans jumped into action to save her life before she was flown to the hospital. The father's pretrial hearing is tomorrow morning at 8.30. <laughs> A bear that was spotted in Summit County a couple of days ago is still roaming around the Park City area. Look at this guy. Man, right there on the deck, just Holy looking around. Cow. Fox 13 News reporter Jenna Bree tells us about one woman's close encounter with nature and how wildlife officials are now having to step in. This bear wandered onto Wendy Preston's back deck on Tuesday. The Fox 13 News viewer tells us it wanted her bird feeder. There's, you know, hummingbird feeders and, you know, residents might have barbecue grills that maybe aren't perfectly clean, that type of thing. And so this bear was being rewarded by coming to town and finding some treats. Scott Rood with Utah's Division of Wildlife Resources says after a big holiday like the 4th of July, a lot of sense can lure bears into human spaces. Typically, if they're, if they're getting rewarded and they come back to the same area, they don't really want to leave because they've, they've got a reward. For the past couple days, a conservation officer has been hazing the bear, gently scaring it away from neighborhoods and back into the hills. We haze it with a little bean bag from a shotgun. It, it stings, but it doesn't hurt the bear. It gives it an unpleasant experience, and they often just run off. Well, we did that and it still came back. So we may have to relocate it. The DWR might need to try a more direct approach to get the bear back home. We may just have to put up a live culvert trap, you know, and bait it, get it to come in, the door closes behind it, and we just haul it off further up the mountain, you know, a few miles away. For now, Root says there's no danger to the public. This bear is nothing to fear. Bears typically, they just have their their heads to the ground and and they're sniffing they have that great sense of smell they're looking for roots and bulbs and and you know maybe uh, ground squirrels or whatever but they're not really out to get us in salt lake city jenna Bree, fox 13 news utah
Well, Not really out to get us. So you hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice thought. That, that was a skinny bear, too. He looked like he was hungry. So. Oh, I know. That's probably the case. But he needs to look for food elsewhere. Elsewhere. Not on people's backyard That's porches. Right. Over there, bear. <laughs> Go way over there. Way away if you're smart. <laughs> hey, if you spot this bear or any other bear in Summit County or any place else, the sheriff's office does ask for you to call to let them know. And, of course, never approach wildlife. No, 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 okay. no. Yeah. Whether it's a bear or a moose or or even deer, you gotta yeah. be careful yeah. of deer too. What if you're hiking with your family? Yeah, the oh Grand my God. Tetons. <laughs> and? The, bear, the bear we saw. Oh, that's right. This was in Jackson Hall. Was much bigger than that one. Was yeah. it? Yes. Yeah, and, and we did not and, get near. And, and what did you say to the bear, Kelly? <laughs> can you reenact that? Kelly did tell it to go away. Can you, can you go, just <laughs> Again, go ahead. If you didn't hear the story the first time, Gary, and get ready. I, She's going to scream. Say, Mom, we did not need bear spray because the <laughs> shrill of your voice <laughs> was enough <laughs> to scare that bear and every oh, other one in the yeah. park. Well, your heart must have been pumping <laughs> really hard. You know, oh my it's goodness. such a magnificent sight to see wildlife out in yeah. nature, but at the same time, when oh you God, realize there are no your heart. No cage between you and the bear. Yeah. Yeah, wow, wow, wow. Story, yeah. Well, I think that anybody who's doing any adventuring here across the state the next couple of days will want to get out early. We don't have the chance for flash flooding here across the state, so you might hear that and be like, okay, awesome. Let me just go ahead and plan some great adventures for this weekend. Be really cognizant of the heat as we head into the next couple of days. It's still hot here in Salt Lake right now at 89 degrees, 94 Ogden, 84 for Provo right now. In case you're wondering how today worked out, we didn't quite hit 100 degrees, but we were awfully close at 99 degrees for a high today. A normal high is 92. A record for today would have been 104. We had a hot stretch this time last year. In fact, St. George on June or on July 11th last year, so on this upcoming Monday, they ended up hitting 117. Wow, wow, wow. We're not that hot in our seven-day forecast, but we're hot. 75 tomorrow morning for Salt Lake for the morning drive. Dry roads tomorrow and into tomorrow evening, 100 degrees just about. So we look at our satellite and radar here across the state today. Mostly clear sky. We had a few thunderstorms north by 70 today, but we're tracking mostly clear sky here across the state tonight and we're going to have really breezy conditions this weekend so any of those fun plans that you do have for the weekend it's going to be hot and breezy across the region fire dangers high especially for western utah mainly dry roads here across the region and then we're going to have some moderate air quality so if you can consolidate trips our carpool we do have the voluntary action to travel wise for tomorrow speaking of fire we have elevated fire concerns into western utah mainly along i-15 and further west we look at our overnight temps it'll be around 60 to 75 degrees for ogden salt lake provo tuila 76 early tomorrow morning St. George, mid-70s, so maybe even cooler than us here along the Wasatch Front. And it will be breezy tomorrow. We're going to have those wind gusts by 5 o'clock, around 15 to 25 miles per hour here across the entire state. So tomorrow for highs, it will be around 95 to 100 degrees for the Wasatch Front with sunshine and those breezy conditions. It's like a blow dryer on you 24 seven. And then for St. George, you're close to 105 tomorrow. This weekend, closer to 105 to 110. And we'll keep you there through your entire seven day forecast. Remember earlier what I was saying, come Monday, your record is 117. So you're not quite there, but you're still awfully hot. For the Wasatch Front, we're close to 100 to 105 Friday, Saturday. A tiny bit cooler Sunday, Monday, but still hot near 100 degrees. We'll talk more about this heat and how long that will last. Will it last beyond the seven-day forecast? How far into July? I'll let you know. Allison, thanks. Just ahead, what Davis County is doing to spread the message about the dangers of underage drinking. Plus, a new library branch is opening in South Salt Lake next week. How it's paying homage to the old Granite High School and what modern features you'll find there.
Utahns are spreading the word about the dangers of underage drinking and doing it on the road. The group North Davis Communities That Care and Parents Empowered have brought together 14 community partners to support the prevention of underage drinking. Messages center on protecting children's futures. They'll be found on 225 public safety and construction vehicles. The signs are in both Spanish and English. They'll also encourage parents to spend at least 15 minutes a day with their children. Talking about a drinking may seem a little bit difficult at first, but it does not have to be a formal, long talk. In fact, um, small chats when you're playing video games or driving with them um, in your car. Uh, start those conversations. Start understanding um, a little bit about what they know and let them understand that they're in a safe space to discuss this. The community partners include the Davis County Sheriff's Office, three cities, and many more construction companies and their vehicles. A new county library will open in South Salt Lake next week. The library will be taking the spot of the old Granite High School building, which closed in 2009. The branch will incorporate the school's colors and designs in its new construction. We spoke in depth with the Salt Lake Tribune's culture reporter, Pollock Jaswal, on Fox 13 News Live at noon today about what features residents can expect to be available in the new library facility. So this audio visual room, they can record video with a green screen. Um, they can do 3D printing. They can record podcasts. Um, and then there are more traditional functions too, right? So books, obviously, to check out, but there are programming rooms, study rooms. Sounds great. Also, you can get some nice air conditioning sitting in that <laughs> new library as well. Nice cooling center. The facility will also feature a farmer's way area, highlighting the region's history with photos and the seal mosaic from the old high school's entrance. Pretty cool. He's accused of hitting and killing two three-year-olds as he careened out of control in Eagle Mountain. As soon as we got in the car, the red cabin, honestly. Tonight, testimony from people who were in his car that night. We don't have copious amounts of water. You can look at it as a blame game or you can look at it as an opportunity. Agriculture is a huge user of water. So what are they doing in the ongoing drought? I'm going to show you. A new subvariant of COVID-19 is already dominating new cases in the U.S. Coming up, a look at what BA.5 might mean going forward. And the Jazz wrap up their summer league play here at home before hitting the road. We'll show you who's standing out later in Fox 13 Sports. The man charged in the deaths of two Eagle Mountain toddlers was in court today for a preliminary hearing. It's been two months now since that tragedy happened. Fox 13 News reporter Chris Arnold was there when two people in the car with Kent Cody Barlow told what happened that night. I noticed that we somehow were like next to a house or something and that we ran into like a lot of stuff. Jeremy Gomez was in the back seat of Kemp Cody Barlow's car when it allegedly left the road on the evening of May 2nd. Barlow's car went crashing through a fence and into a corral, killing three-year-old Odin Ratliff and Hunter Jackson, who were playing at the time. There, yeah, there's people outside. So I'm like, terrified, scared. Gomez says he originally put on his seatbelt when he got in the car with Barlow and was fearful, as he says Barlow accelerated to speeds upwards of 80 miles per hour. The car like slapped into like the road and then lifted up. So you could just pretty much see the point of view of a road to just look and share by like the sky. Barlow sat silent and appeared emotionless as both Gomez and another passenger in the car at the time, Taylor Karchner, detailed the events leading up to the crash. Was Tom to stop at that stop sign? I don't remember exactly what was said, but I do remember everybody else in the back screaming to stop. The Utah County detective also taking the stand today, saying that Barlow had methamphetamine in his system at the time of the crash. At the end of today's preliminary hearing, Judge Robert Lund scheduled an oral argument for later this month. So whether or not the standard of proof at this stage, which is probable cause, has been met, in particular with regard to the possession of methamphetamine count. 
That oral argument is scheduled for the 28th of this month. Now, we did also try to talk to Barlow's defense attorneys after the preliminary hearing today, and they just simply told us to not regurgitate what both the police and prosecution have been telling us about this case. Now, as it stands right now, Barlow is facing two charges of manslaughter and an additional charge of possession of a controlled substance. In Provo, Chris Arnold, Fox 13 News, Utah. We don't have copious amounts of water, and ag is a big user of the water that humans have available in the state. And, you know, you can look at it as a blame game or you can look at it as an opportunity. Utah's biggest water users are making some big changes. Some farms and ranches are experimenting with new water saving technologies, and it's already showing signs of progress. Fox 13 News political reporter Ben Winslow went to Tremont today and saw early signs that this effort is working. On this field, we grow barley, corn. These new automated watering systems have replaced what Richard Eagle used to do every night. I've been doing it for 60 years, and changing water takes a long time, most nights, so all night long. And these boys now, they just do it on their phone. The organic farm in Tremonton is using new technology designed to save water. They got a grant from Utah's Department of Agriculture and Food to buy the equipment. It cost about 300000 but it's already resulting in savings. I think it was worth it for us. Um, it saved in water, like I said, a third of it we were able to save. We were go, be able to go across the land quicker, um, and then it's a whole lot easier to change the water. Agriculture is a top user of water in the state. Farmers and ranchers have had their water shares cut in the ongoing drought. Some areas like the Weber Basin have experienced up to a 40% cut in their, their water uh, for irrigation this year. There are ways for agriculture to save water, but it costs money. Not all people realize that it does take water to grow food, and we all like to eat. The state legislature funded $70 million to push what's called agriculture optimization. It's new technology for water savings. The Utah Department of Agriculture and Food is offering a 50-50 matching grant for farmers to make the switch. We manage a very large system. It's about well, it's 68,000 acres, 126 miles of canal, and has a very large footprint. The Bear River Canal Company is using some money to do a number of things to save water. We've made tremendous inroads on water conservation and water management, which is uh, a huge part of operating a canal system. They're lining some canals and covering others. But we're trying something unique. We're implementing something that's different than a lot of other systems in the West. They're replacing some of these old hand-cranked irrigation gates. Click that, and then you just input what you want. They are extremely accurate. And, and you can just do this with your phone? Yeah, so all of this just happens right here. This is the exact same site. With automated ones that are a lot more accurate. This is some of the best tax dollars being spent in the state right now because what I'm able to accomplish with these grants is saving water, is making a difference not only for the farmers, but for the general citizens as well. The Utah Department of Agriculture and Food will be opening up another round of grants for farmers in the near future. In Tremont, Ben Winslow, Fox 13 News, Utah. 83% of Utah is now listed in extreme drought, but only about 8% of central and southern Utah is in exceptional drought, which is the worst category. That is an improvement in this week's drought report card. Last year, 65% of the state was in the worst drought conditions. Well, happening right now, a power outage in Cottonwood Heights is impacting only about 30 customers, but one of those is the Smith's Grocery Store on Bangle Boulevard. According to a Fox 13 News viewer, the store was turning customers away, saying that they could not sell refrigerated perishables like milk. Fox 13 News tried calling the store to confirm, but due to the outage, it appears their phone lines are not working. Also just into the Fox 13 newsroom, the Summit County Sheriff's Office says a Provo man is dead after a crash this afternoon. Deputies say the 21-year-old man was riding his e-bike south on East Frontage Road near For uh, Forestdale Road at about 3 p.m. When he swerved into oncoming traffic, he was hit by a GMC truck. The cyclist was wearing a helmet. His identity is being withheld until his family can be notified. Next, an update on the state of COVID-19 in Utah, plus details on a new sub-variant that's now gaining momentum.
And the heat is on here across the state with high pressure shifting back into the area. Temperatures are on the rise. So how long will the temperatures last at the near record level? I'll let you know. We have more breaking news tonight. The former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been rushed to the hospital after a possible shooting. Japan's public broadcasting group NHK says Abe was speaking in Nara, Japan at a campaign event. NHK reports witnesses are saying there were two gunshots. And Kyoto News says that Abe was taken away and appeared to be in cardiac arrest. Reuters reports a suspect was detained at the scene. We will continue to follow this breaking news overseas in Japan and bring the latest to you here on Fox 13 News at 9 and online at fox13now.com. Well, close to 6,900 Utahns tested positive for COVID-19 over the past week. That is down 5.7% compared to the week before, but the number of people in the hospital went up. 314 COVID patients were admitted throughout the week. And in the past week, 13 more Utahns died from the virus. Those numbers may go back up soon with a new subvariant taking over in the U.S. Doctors say BA.5 is more transmissible than any previous previous version of coronavirus. Fox 13 News anchor Max Roth takes an in-depth look. BA.5 is a sub-variant of Omicron. It doesn't appear to cause more severe illness than other kinds, but all signs suggest it spreads far more easily than anything that's come before. In one early research article, scientists from Columbia University found BA.5 and its close relative BA.4 as substantially 4.2-fold more resistant to antibodies and thus more likely to lead to vaccine breakthrough infections. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show the variants of concern by region on this map. Now the dark green on each pie chart, that's BA.5. The light green is BA.4. Two months ago, the subvariants represented less than a half of 1% of cases in the U.S. Last week, more than half of infections are BA.5, with another 17%, 0.4. That includes Utah and the other Rocky Mountain states, estimated to now have BA.5, making up 50% of new cases. The doctors from Columbia University who authored that study of BA.5 and 0.4, they say vaccines appear to help keep illness less severe, but that increased transmissibility is still likely to lead to more hospitalizations simply because it will infect more people. In studio, Max Roth, Fox 13 News, Utah. Why now? Why Salt Lake City? And they say, because we want to make a difference. Still ahead, a big day for Salt Lake City Police as they welcome brand new Academy graduates. We'll hear from some of the new officers and their chief. And later in sports, a look ahead at the upcoming State Am and the Summer Hayes legacy on that event. While well, the Jazz wrapped up the Salt Lake portion of their Summer League, could they finally score a win at the Viv? Back in a bit. Salt Lake County has released more primary election returns. Okay, here is the closely watched Utah State Senate race representing a big chunk of Salt Lake County. Look at the numbers. Dr. Jennifer Plum now leads incumbent Senator Derek Kitchen by only 62 votes. Now, the results, however, might not change much after this. There are 329 provisional ballots countywide still to be counted. In Harriman, a SWAT team took a woman into custody after she barricaded herself inside a house this morning. It started with a disturbance at a Taco Bell before 7 a.m. That led to a chase in the neighborhood near 118th South and Rushmore Park Lane. That's where a woman allegedly broke a window of a house and went in. Police believe she was armed with a knife at the time. Eventually, they forced her out by deploying a chemical into the house and took her into custody. Throughout this entire incident, including her interaction with the tactical team, she was given multiple opportunities to comply and to surrender peacefully, and she chose not to. It was very, very odd. It was a safe neighborhood. There was children and parents and the two blocks from the middle school. Uh, it's, very atypical for here. If it's 6.30 in the morning and someone breaks in your house and you are there, you're sleeping, what would you do? 
Police say their crisis intervention team will evaluate her mental health status in addition to the ongoing criminal investigation. The residents were not home at the time. A driver of a dump truck has been arrested for DUI following a collision with another vehicle this afternoon. According to Utah Highway Patrol, the driver of the truck cut in front of another vehicle while going eastbound along 7200 West. They hit the vehicle, lost control, and then rolled. The load of gravel the truck was carrying spilled as well closing the road between 80th West to 7200 West. The dump truck driver has been arrested for DUI. Well, 21 recruits from the Salt Lake City Police Academy are now one step closer to taking to the streets and serving the community. Class 156 graduated from the Academy today. Fox 13 News attended the event, speaking with some of the new officers, as well as Police Chief Mike Brown. When asked if recruiting has been difficult these past few years, this is what he said. And we ask him that question. Why now? Why Salt Lake City? And they say, because we want to make a difference. So it's kind of been something I've always wanted to do just growing up, but I just kind of had that hesitation. Um, and then when I worked at Gold Cross and just had that exposure to um, police officers, I just more and more wanted to do that job. And it just became more apparent to me that that's what I wanted to do as I met more and more police officers. Chief Brown says these officers will now go into a field training program before reporting for duty on the streets. Well, it was a hot day here across the state. We made it to 99 degrees here in Salt Lake City. This is a live look from the Natural History Museum facing west towards downtown. You can see the Walker Center Tower right there, and that's kind of spoiling the forecast. It's blue. We've got clear sky the next couple of days. 89 here in Salt Lake, 90 still in Ogden, and 84 in Provo. Here's what I want you to know. The main takeaway is it's going to be hot and windy tomorrow. That leads to fire concerns. Red flag warnings have been issued starting at noon tomorrow through Saturday at 9 p.m. for northern and western Utah. This does also include portions of central Utah. So our strongest winds will be noon to 9 p.m. each day, and we're going to continue with those dry conditions, that heat out of the southwest, the windy conditions over the next couple of afternoons that'll die down once we get towards about 9 o'clock tomorrow night, but it's going to be a hot weekend here across the state. Tomorrow morning, get out early. Temperatures around 65 to 75 for many of you when you wake up. For Provo, mid-60s. Twila, Salt Lake, Ogden in the 70s tomorrow morning. Then we heat up really quickly. We're close to 100 degrees tomorrow with increasing clouds into southwest Utah. So our temperatures the next few days will be really hot. Our flash flood potential is not expected for tomorrow. So I'm happy about that, but it's just going to be so hot. It's going to be tough to get outside and enjoy our beautiful state. Close to 105 to 110 for the next week in St. George. Breezy at times, especially over the next couple of days. And we're going to keep these hot temperatures around for quite a while. So tomorrow in your Super 7 Day forecast, let's go ahead and go a little more in depth for you for our wind. Let's pause this at 5 p.m. Wind 15 to 25 miles per hour across the state. Saturday, mostly sunny. We're creeping close to 105 in Salt Lake. So we're going to have moderate air quality, very hot temperatures, and voluntary action. So we look at the next few days, 97 on Sunday, so it'll be a little bit cooler, but obviously 97 is still really hot. And we're going to have that chance for a few showers off to our east Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon, generally staying dry here across Utah. So by Monday, we're still in the mid to upper 90s. Then we're back close to 100 degrees. And by next Wednesday, we're back close to 105 again. So as we look at our temperature outlook in week two, this is after the seven day forecast, the 15th of July through the 21st of July, we likely keep our temperatures above average here in Utah and we'll keep you very hot through the entire seven day forecast. And as you just saw, probably through at least the 21st of July. The first two attempts at their own summer league didn't end up in the win column for the Jazz. Not surprising for a team without a single draft pick in last month's draft. But they had a third and final shot at one tonight, this time against the Grizzlies. Jared Butler back in the lineup, but the guy who carried the load on Wednesday was right back at it tonight. Bruno Caboclo. 
Mexico. The big Brazilian then following up with a triple as well to lift Utah up a dozen in the first. 17 for him off the bench. Butler then getting going in the second. How about this move through the rinse cycle with just a second or two till the half. A game high 22 for him, though, just like Philly did last night. Here comes Memphis late. Jake LaRavia coming right through. And then tough shot here. Tremont Waters. The Jazz outscored by 23 tonight to get swept this week at the Viv. They're now off to Vegas beginning on Saturday. The 124th Utah State Amateur tees off next week, starting with stroke play qualifying on Monday and Tuesday. And then it's match play, which ends with a 36-hole final over the weekend. The State Am is back at Soldier Hollow for the seventh time, where some great players have won, including Tony Finau along with two-time winner Preston Summerhays. In fact, the Summerhays family was honored at today's media day for their legacy in this uh, historic event, which every player in Utah wants to win. This is like my U.S. Open. I mean, obviously the U.S. Sam, playing the U.S. Sam, and that would be unbelievable to win, but this one, is it ranks up there for me personally. It's like, this is one that I want to win. I want to win the state now. It's the oldest continuous golf tournament in the world, and it, it, it matters a lot. To be able to put your name on any trophy, especially this one, is, is very special, and I, I'm really honored to have done it. And to have it on there twice is pretty awesome. And try to get one more, but I'm getting pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> And game three of six this week for the Bees against Sacramento. The Rivercats putting up a five spot in the second. Elio Ramos challenging Matt Theis in center. Theis climbing the ladder but can't quite pull that one down. Salt Lake, though, went for five of their own. Bottom two here. Jake Palomaki flares one into the left field corner, which ended up being a ground rule double. And that was followed by Jose Rojas sniffing out the opposite corner, only his clears the fence two run shot for the lead a lot of runs in this one and fortunately sacramento has scored the last six so they lead by the football score of 14 to eight oh mm, that and that's still run. going on ninth inning okay well, well they come can on, still bees. come back it's baseball <laughs> it's and baseball they lose, anything they got another can one happen. friday saturday and sunday oh. so plenty of opportunities to win hopefully they get it's them. nice to get them all though yeah. come on morgan <laughs> home run We'll be right back. Thanks for being part of Fox 13 News at 9. Quick cast is up next.